Hello everyone. Today we are going to explore how to determine if there is a dilution component affecting your hemoglobin levels. For instance, imagine a patient hemoglobin level was 15 at the time of admission and has now dropped to 12. How can you tell if this is due to bleeding versus it simply being a result of dilution? In these scenarios, it's crucial to avoid guessing and aim for more accurate assessment. Understanding how to calculate the dilution component will enable you to make more informed decision. So let's dive deep into this topic. Let's say we have 5 liter of fluid and a solute concentration of 15 gram per dl. When we dilute it with 1 liter of water, our new volume is going to be 6 liters and the final concentration will be lower as same solute is now distributed in 6 liter rather than 5 liters. So let's try to find this new concentration. Since the amount of solute in both the situation is the same, the amount of solute on one side will be equal to your initial concentration multiplied by initial volume and this should be equal to your final solute which will be equal to your final concentration multiplied by the final volume. Solving for n we get 12.5 gram per dl. Always note the unit of measurements when performing such calculation. Since RBCs do not leak outside you can use this formula to calculate the degree of dilution if you know how much of fluid you gave has remained intravascular. So the only question we need to answer is the amount of fluid that you have added to the intravascular compartment. We have discussed how much fluid remains in the intravascular compartment when you give various IV fluid in our previous lectures. Please free feel to review those. However, we'll touch this topic briefly here. To know how much of the volume remains intravascular, you need to know two things. Know what fluid compartments are present in the body and know the volume of distribution of fluid. In a 70 kilo person, 42 kilo of which is water is distributed in your ICF and ECF. ECF is divided into interstitial compartment and intravascular compartment. Note that the intravascular compartment has ICF part which is the cellular component and the plasma which is your ECF portion. This will vary depending upon your hematocrit. Know that these are approximate numbers and will vary depending on underlying etiologies such as heart failure, hemorrhage, sepsis, etc. It will also vary according to your age, gender, obesity and volume status of the individual. Let's examine 0.9% saline. Since sodium is an extracellular ion, it will distribute evenly in your ECF. This will distribute in intravascular and interstitium in proportion to their volume. Thus, amount remaining intravascular will be the plasma volume divided by the total ECF volume multiplied by the volume of saline that you gave. And this gives us 200 cc's. Since other crystalloids have slightly different constitution, approximately 150 to 200 cc's remain intravascular when you give a balanced crystalloid. So let's see how much of dilution will happen when you give a liter of crystalloid. We know that of a liter, only 200 cc's is going to remain intravascular. So if you use the formula at different hemoglobin levels, you can see that on an average, one liter of crystalloid will drop your hemoglobin by 0.5 gram per dl in a 70 kilo person. This drop will depend upon the level of hemoglobin. Similarly, a liter of D5 will be distributed in both ICF and ECF as dextrose is used up and water will move freely in all the compartments and will distribute as per the ratios of volume of these compartments. Therefore, the fluid remaining intravascular will be the plasma volume divided by the total volume multiplied by the amount of D5 that you have used and we get 70 cc's. So out of a liter of D5, only 70 cc's remains intravascular. Let's look at 5% albumin. A liter of 5% albumin actually has 50 grams of albumin in 1 liter of normal saline. Of 1 liter of normal saline, we know that only 200 cc's will remain intravascular. As for the albumin is concerned, we learned that a gram of albumin holds on to about 10 ml of water. So total plasma volume expansion will be 200 cc's from the saline and 500 cc's from that 50 grams of albumin that you gave this patient. So this gives us total of 700 cc's. Note that with time, albumin is going to equilibrate between the intravenous and interstitium and in the end only 200 cc's will remain intravascular after many hours. 
This slide gives you an estimate of intravascular volume increase with three commonly used fluids. However, as the time progresses, the albumin is going to re-equilibrate and only 200 cc of it will remain intravascular. One of the things to note that we are assuming no renal or incipient losses. In real life, you have to put those two into account as well. Since patients are getting multiple IV drips and not just boluses of fluid, you have to add them as well. A lot of times, antibiotics, sedatives and pressors are constituted in saline as well. Also, since you lose fluid in your urine and stool, you need to look at your net ins and outs rather than amount of fluid given. So now you can examine the drop in hemoglobin with more confidence. However, there are two other factors that can affect drop in hemoglobin which are not coming from bleeding or hemolysis. First of these is the amount of blood removed during the blood draws. Amount of blood drawn is about 70 cc per day on an average with around 150 to 200 cc drawn on the first day. Sicker the patient, more the amount of blood draw. You can see the usual amount of blood drawn for some of these tests. And if you have a central or arterial line for the blood draws, you waste some of it with every draw as well. Since a normal person makes about 50 cc of blood every day, and this number is a lot lower in sicker patient due to bone marrow suppression, mostly from inflammation and acute stress, you can see why most of the patient in ICU are anemic and get gastroenterology consultations. The other factor that you have to remember is the error rate of lab when measuring hemoglobin levels. This is in order of 5 to 10 percent, which gives a range of plus minus 0.5 gram per deal. So if you see hemoglobin of 13, it really means that your hemoglobin ranges between 12.5 to 13.5. You can use the above information that we talked about to understand the fluid distribution in your patients. Let's say on admission, hemoglobin was 13 and you observed that the total blood draw amount was somewhere in the range of 200 cc and in the last 24 hours the net i's and o's was around plus 5 liters you should be able to get an idea where the next day hemoglobin will be and this you can do by subtracting the amount of hemoglobin from the blood draws and then using our formula to figure out the final concentration in this case n equals 10.7 gram per dl Let's say your hemoglobin on the lab shows up to be 12 gram per deal instead of 10.7. This gives you some interesting information. This suggests that most of that extra fluid ended up in the interstitium and less remained intravascular. Watch my lecture on the interstitium to understand why this can happen. Another reason for this high hemoglobin can be large amount of incipient losses, such as seen in burn victims and can also be seen in high respiratory rates and sweating. Let's say lab showed hemoglobin of 8 gram per deal. This would suggest that your patient is either losing blood or his hemolysis as the drop is more than what you could account for. I tried to look at the dilution factor and the amount of blood draws, especially within first 24 to 48 hours of admission to differentiate the drop in hemoglobin from bleeding versus dilution. This helps me prioritize my decision making about anticoagulation calling gastroenterologist or using high-dose proton pump inhibitors. Understanding these calculations will help you make more accurate clinical judgments. Interestingly, creatinine can be diluted on the first day of resuscitation as well and can result in false confidence that your renal function is improving. We also know that creatinine lags behind worsening renal function as well. And combination of the dilution and delay in rise in creatinine will delay nephrology consultation and result in poor drug dosing. To avoid this error, make sure that you monitor urine output along with watching creatinine. And this is the reason why I use rifle or Aiken criteria for identifying renal failure rather than looking at creatinine alone. To end, let's understand some of the limitations of this presentation. Most important thing is knowing the volume of distribution and the factors that affect it. The numbers that we have used are standard numbers, but these can be different under different conditions. Thus, volume of distribution of any fluid will depend upon volume status, vasodilatory or vasoconstrictive state, venodilation, state of glycocalyx and interstitium, especially in case of inflammation. This can also change with surgery, anesthesia, and degree of shock. Volume of distribution also depends upon time since bolus, lymphatic function, 
body position and rate of infusion. I have discussed some of this in my previous lecture on interstitial. Please feel free to watch that. To summarize, dilution is common in ICU where patients receive quite a bit of crystalloid. And since the amount of solute should remain same if you are not bleeding, you should be able to remove the dilution component by using our formula. Initial concentration multiplied by initial volume should be equal to your final concentration multiplied by the final volume. Know the volume of distribution of fluid and the parameters that affect this volume distribution. This will help you understand the degree of dilution better and help you understand your patient's underlying pathophysiology. Although these methods are helpful in many situations, always use your clinical judgment and use additional information to hone on that clinical decision. So if your hemoglobin drops in your ICU in first 24 to 48 hours, certainly it's okay to think about hemorrhage and hemolysis, but also pay attention to dilution, multiple lab draws and error in margin of hemoglobin estimation. Thank you.